Good afternoon and uh, good evening, good morning to the global audience. It's a pleasure being here. And I'm afraid we're going to discuss something which is at the heart of everybody's life, in this, especially in this last year. Pandemic has hit our societies, our lives, and we're still uh, struggling as an international community to find uh, the right solutions, to find the tools for everybody to make sure that this pandemic isn't uh, another factor of inequality all over the globe. So we will have the privilege to discuss all these issues uh, with uh, Agnes, Agnes Binagro, who's the Vice Chancellor of the University of Global Health Equity in Rwanda. She will be with us from remote in a few seconds. With uh, Professor Alberto Mantovani, who's the Scientific Director of uh, Instituto Clinico Humanitas. Uh, he has an incredibly long career in the field. Uh, Presidente Monti, Professor Monti, now in the capacity as a chair of the Pan-European Commission on Health and Sustainable Development for the WHO. Here, Mrs. Binagua, it's a pleasure having you with us this afternoon. But uh, uh, first of all, uh, before uh, starting our discussion, uh, we have a keynote address, and uh, it's the keynote address of the Director General of the WHO, Tedros Ghebreyesus. I would like to thank the Italian Institute for International Political Studies and Bocconi University for co-hosting this summit, and the government of Italy for its committed leadership of the G20. We are encouraged that in their the declaration last month, the G20 health ministers expressed support for WHO's global target to vaccinate 40% of the population in every country by the end of this year. We hope that at their meeting this month, the G20 leaders will also support our target to vaccinate 70% of the population of every country by the middle of next year. To reach those targets, we need 2 billion doses for low and lower middle income countries right now. I appeal to leaders of countries and companies uh, that control the global supply of vaccines to act immediately and put us on a path towards ending the pandemic. But of course, vaccines alone are not enough. Countries must continue to use public health and social measures along with diagnostics, support quarantine, and effective interventions such as medical oxygen. At the same time, we must learn the lessons the pandemic is teaching us that means better governance and better financing for global health and a sustainably financed WHO that's empowered to fulfill its role at the center of the global health architecture. And it means supporting countries to build resilient health systems based on strong primary health care. That is the best defense against health threats of all types, from outbreaks to diseases of all types, and to the existential threat of climate change. The pandemic has taken so much from us, but it's also giving us the opportunity to write a healthier, safer, fairer, and more sustainable future. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the Director General. A round of applause. Professor uh, Binaguaho, I'd like to start with you and address your question because what we just heard, uh, Director General was telling us uh, vaccines are not enough. Okay, but in some places, like in Africa, vaccines is the first part of the problem because uh, uh, we know that right now we have uh, 8.4 doses per 100 people which makes us look at the future in a very worried way. So would you please help us understanding a little better what's going 
on there and what are the perspectives? First of all, thank you for having me. I'm very pleased to join you in this very, very important debate. And uh, to give you a sense, I think that you start your remarks by saying, we hope that this COVID-19 is going to be another occasion for inequities. It's too late. It's already another occasion for inequities for a long time. And uh, inside countries, because the most vulnerable suffer more, but also between high and low income country. Why? Because the vaccine are um, in the high income countries, they are blocking the supply chain of, uh, uh, they are blocking the fact that we can produce more vaccine and they have blocked too long the possibility for Africa to create the vaccine because there is no more uh, vaccine on, uh, not enough vaccine on the market. And the rich countries are holding vaccine, they're stocking them. And it's because of that, that there is no vaccine enough on the market. We have only vaccinated 3% of the African continent. And, uh, um, and Europe has vaccinated more than 50%. But it's not because there is vaccine hesitancy in Africa. It's just because vaccines are not available. And uh, uh, another important thing that makes me afraid is the greed of pharmaceutical companies. They have made already billions of profit, but they have recently increased the price, not for the low-income countries, for the, the developed countries, but soon we know it will come to, to us. In addition, if uh, we, uh, we, we can see that uh, many of the African countries, the majority of them, will not reach the target of vaccinating 10% of their population this year as it was planned a year ago. And this because there is no vaccine on the market. So this inequality exists. For example, in my country, a year ago, we pay in advance for one million, for almost two, bill, two million doses. And we don't receive that. Why? Because a pharma give preference to rich countries, even if they receive the money of, high income, of low income countries, they don't serve them as a priority. Even if the, the vaccine they give is to go and be stocked in uh, the, the, um, the storage in high-income countries, and even if they, are, uh, they get the, uh, the, the date of preemption there and they are true in the dustbin, Europe has already destroyed thousands and thousands and thousands of vaccines since July just because they expire on, uh, on shelf. So this is uh, why I am scared, and this is why I found that this is a shaming situation, um, and this is also a dangerous situation that creates a favorable condition for variant to emerge. Uh, as Africa is not vaccinated, one day we may face, but Africa and other low-income countries, we may face the emergence of variants that no vaccine will be protecting against. So what is the matter to do this? It's against science, it's against logic, it's against morality, and also uh, it's against self-protection because stopping the pandemic should have been the, the motto of all the world and not nationalistically stock vaccine in case of some countries have what it takes to vaccinate five times the population when the rest of the world is at 3%. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think it's so important the kind of perspective you gave us. And this is why, Professor Mantovani, uh, I think uh, even the debate which is taking place in, uh, in Europe, in our country, is so important. And this is why uh, I mentioned uh, uh, you are the scientific director of Humanitas, but uh, you're a member of the steering committee of Fondazione Cariplo, and you're working on, even on the perceptions about uh, uh, 
uh, the pandemic, and uh, we're fighting against uh, spreading of fake news. Uh, we have uh, seen people resisting to the vaccines, which is exactly the opposite situation in some ways, uh, if compared to what we just heard. Well, let me first say that I second what was said. It's a concern that I have because of moral points, because there is a general rule that when you run clinical trials in a community, you are supposed to give back to the community. And the trials were run in low-income countries. And finally, because their security is our security. And we have a challenge also of transforming a vaccine delivered there into a vaccination, which is not simple, the last mile. So I, I, I thought I should say that. <laughs> uh, going back to your question, well, two weeks ago we had the uh, Science 20 Summit in, uh, uh, in Rome. Uh, the Accademia dei Lincei organized that, and uh, I, I should say that Giorgio uh, Today it's a very nice day for that. It's a fantastic day because the president, uh, Giorgio Parisi, got the Nobel Prize uh, for physics. For physics. So. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, I want to emphasize that it was Giorgio Parisi who wanted to have the S20 together with the double S20, social science 20, because his perception and vision was that the social science and the hard science should go hand in hand against fake news and against dissemination. So, fighting the uh, fake news means uh, taking advantage of social sciences and all we can learn from social science, number one. The second point is that I ask myself the question, so what, I mean, I echo, a, a, famous president, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, <laughs> what can I do <laughs> against fake news? Uh, and, uh, uh, and, or what we can do as a scientific community? Well, uh, I, I feel that uh, in addition to the usual uh, communication we means, uh, we have to uh, go to the schools. I mean, tonight I'm going to lecture to uh, uh, lay people to schools, trade unions, I lectured in trade unions. I think we have to do what I would call molecular dissemination. And Fondazione Cariplo is actively engaged in bridging social, social science and, uh, and hard science. Uh, finally, I think we should try and convey, among the many things that we should try and convey, we should try and convey uh, the sense of the danger of not acting. I give you an example. I mean, uh, all the major countries are, are now engaged in a third dose of the vaccine for the frail uh, people. I underline the point for the frail uh, people. Uh, and of course, we have limited information on that. But it would be very dangerous not acting. People uh, call on us and say, well, we have no guarantee that the messenger RNA vaccines don't have long-term effects. Well, we are reasonably sure there is, there is no uh, long-term effect. And it would be very dangerous not to act. So we should convey the message that under certain conditions, there is a danger of not acting. So those are my three reflections on those points. Which... Uh tells us that we have to act, and this is why I'm going uh, to Professor Monti, President. In the uh, commission you're chairing, you're focusing on the solutions and uh, on the uh, new procedures that have to be implemented to respond to health needs. In some ways, this pandemic got us by surprise, and uh, this shouldn't happen again, so you're studying on this. So what are the recommendations out there? Thank you, Monica. Uh, I believe that uh, our work, which is not the work of pure scientists, but is the work of a widely diverse commission composed of scientists, uh, in the hard sense, uh, economists, uh, stakeholders of health systems, 
and uh, former heads of states and governments wanted to look at uh, the lessons to be drawn from the pandemic in view of finding a new strategy for health and sustainable development. And uh, uh, we come up uh, with a number of, I believe, concrete recommendations, uh, which uh, uh, form part of a new bold strategy for health and sustainable development. To do so, uh, we have to mentally and practically and operationally achieve two steps. I'm saying things that to Professor Mantovani will uh, no doubt uh, appear to be trivialities, but this is not always the case for the general public. Uh, the first step is to fully adopt and make operational the so-called One Health approach. So to be uh, aware that the connections between the health of uh, humans, of animals, of plants, and of the planet, be it in terms of environment, uh, biodiversity, climate change, is crucial and uh, that uh, no uh, compartmentalized solution can be uh, achieved unless there is the holistic approach. Okay, this is the One Health approach, uh, which has a number of uh, organizational and institutional repercussions. For example, in the UN family, there are four separate agencies caring for the health of these four entities, uh, they need, in our recommendations, to work much more in a coordinated manner. But that is not enough. We come to the conclusion that uh, uh, it is also necessary to have a second step, namely to uh, marry this uh, One Health policy with all the other key policies, uh, even far away apparently from health. For example, economic and financial policies, uh, of course intellectual property policies, um, uh, investment policies, uh, international policies, and so on. And it is only if health already beefed up by itself as a one health approach comes to permeate these other policies and to be in turn permeated that uh, uh, far-reaching solutions and sustainable solutions can be, can be uh, achieved. Uh, this may look to be a bit abstract, but this really means uh, putting together different competences and different powers in the institutions. And I believe that with this second step, one health, but also immersed into the general policies, we come close, I believe, I'm not an expert of this, but I believe we come close to what uh, uh, Professor Ilaria Capua, who will speak here tomorrow, calls uh, uh, in a recent book, uh, uh, circular health, which is uh, one health augmented with more intersections with these other policies. Um, maybe in uh, your second question, because I've spoken too long, I can give some concrete examples of where this brings us to. Very good. Thank you so very much, because this gives us uh, a perspective. Uh, it's a different approach. Uh, it's a different way to tackle uh, the health issue. And on this, uh, even the T20 task force worked these days, and I think we can see a video in which uh, we can get the, the contribution from the T20.
recommend that the G20 countries commit themselves to adopting national health policies to deliver quality health care through a balanced model that incorporates hospital centers and decentralized community-based approaches and to invest in the education and training of a more robust health workforce. The One Health strategy should be implemented by adopting a One Health-based conceptual framework. We recommend establishing a new independent science-based reporting of pathogens and other emerging health threats. Researchers should be able and incentivized to share information in a peer-to-peer -peer network, free of political constraints. Schools do not drive COVID outbreak if mitigation measures are in place. Therefore, we recommend that in the future, schools remain open unless the closure is deemed essential as an ultimate measure to control a pandemic. Last, global health equity. To achieve this, we recommend establishing a global health equity observatory that provides data on health inequity within and between countries and the underlying drivers. However, data will be sufficient without complementary systems of global accountability and periodic reporting to institutional mechanisms and bodies. Very clear, and I'd like uh, on this uh, recommendation to go back to Rwanda, to Professor uh, Binagua, because, uh, Professor, uh, I, I can read uh, the sign of your university, which is Global Health University, and you mentioned also equity. I see all the elements there. So, uh, if we want to go back for a second to Africa and uh, uh, the vaccine campaign, what could you recommend? What could you ask for? <clears throat> so, what I could ask for, uh, I, I would ask many things, but let's start by, by what is going on, uh, meaning uh, availability of, of vaccine on the market. If I, you ask me what I ask compared to One Health or what I ask in general? Sorry for... I'm sorry, there was someone talking to me at the same time, but I was asking to you to share with us your vision about what is needed to have Africa progress on the vaccination campaign and make okay. sure that more people are on the safe side. Okay, thank you. I want to be sure because the previous uh, great um, uh, video we saw is about a very essential subject, what is One Health. Uh, for, for Africa to be able to vaccinate um, its population, first of all, I, it's, it's true that uh, vaccine hesitancy is a problem that can be everywhere. But in Africa, it's not the problem because 3% are vaccinated. And a study done by CDC Africa uh, it, uh, showed, shows us that 80% of Africans want to be vaccinated. So we should leave vaccine hesitancy now and focus on the, the gaps. The other thing, there are some countries that are ready. My country is ready. You can bring vaccine that will be given without waste anything. There are some countries who need support. And at the beginning, COVAX was also supposed to give that. So many countries didn't did an effort to equip themselves in new cold chain if were needed because it was supposed to come with COVAX. So we, sh we should help countries who are not ready to distribute in a safe manner quality vaccine in a quality manner. But for countries who are ready, and there are more than one, we should stop rich country to, who are holding vaccine to continue and distribute. You know that at the end of this year, European, the, the rich country will have more than 1 billion doses in excess in their stock. So this is something to do. Second, increase the capacity to produce where vaccine are already produced and 
the European Union, of at least some countries from Europe, has stopped that to happen. Third, waive the trips. I just want to say that even if European Union has waived the trip, we have countries, of course, they are not in European Union, but uh, they are in Europe, like UK, who block it systematically. While a proper framework for licensing will allow Africa to produce quality vaccine. Why the people who have invented, and don't forget the majority have invented with public money and make profit by their own. So those who have invent can still make money out of their invention. Third, we need new partnership for helping Africa to produce quickly the vaccine. And this is in education, in infrastructure, and for some country, as I said, disseminate what will be produced. Uh, so these are things, uh, building human resources, the necessity infrastructure, support the private sector in Africa because they never invest in that and they need to be sure how to do that and strengthen the regulatory system. And this is not complicated, you know. I can just copy what Italy has done and adapt that to my context. So it's not rocket science. And the it can be done. So your message basically is that it can be done. So it's just it a matter of be. choices. Not only can, should be. And done. it should be done. Let me go on this to Professor Mantovani because uh, there's a call for action here, and what we see is that there is a need for a global solidarity. But on the other hand, and she was mentioning that, uh, there is a, a key element, which is this collaboration uh, among you know, private people and public institutions that have been one of the keys of the solution here, and that can be much more for the future. So, well, let, let, first of all, let's... Uh, have a reflection on, on what happened. I mean, uh, we had uh, at uh, speed, uh, at light speed, uh, we had uh, new vaccine platforms, uh, the adenovirus platform, uh, the uh, messenger RNA platform, and that was thanks to high-risk, high-risk fundamental research. And I want to emphasize, in the last uh, week, I had conversation with Catalin Carico, uh, one, <laughs> the mother, together with Weissman, Weissman, Weissman uh, of the uh, Messenger RNA platform, uh, and uh, uh, today with uh, Christ Christoph Huber, one of the fathers, coming from oncology uh, of BioNTech. And we need to have high-risk fundamental research. Uh, for instance, uh, the charity uh, Fondazione Cari, together with Teleton, is now funding research in the IGNO. 20% of the information encoded by the genome, we really don't know what it does. So that's number one. Uh, the second point, during the pandemic, we have had fantastic results by integrating fundamental academic research, be it private, this university here, our university, or public. Fundamental research, small biotech, big biotech, and national healthcare service. So those are, th th that has been key, uh, and we need to improve some of the rules uh, and uh, soften some uh, of, the, of the rules. We have had experience of that, uh, and that has been key. The third uh, point uh, that I would, uh, I would uh, stress uh, is that national health care service. Uh, I, my dream is to have the national health care service as a lab that addresses important questions for the public. And there are examples for that. The recovery platform in the UK. I mean, we have learned amazing things, both in terms of low-cost interventions and uh, and providing a platform for industry, for testing what really works and what doesn't work. And it's important to learn from that. So those are my, my points. Going to another point, Professor Monti, uh, in your commission report, you proposed to the G20 
the idea of a health board. So on one hand, uh, you told us uh, we need to change the approach and see it as a one health approach. On the other hand, you're suggesting this institution. Why? Why do we need a new institution to address this issue? Well, to put uh, the global order in a better position vis-à-vis uh, -vis pandemics or health threats in general, we believe, first of all, as almost everybody does, that WHO should be strengthened, given more powers vis-à-vis -vis member states, given a um, more robust uh, uh, financial structure, reducing, at least in percentage terms, its dependence on uh, private donations, on foundations, and so on. But we believe that uh, uh, although the WHO should keep all the uh, powers in terms of health uh, contents, it uh, cannot deliver all that is needed for a stronger set of health systems unless there is more proximity between the world of health and the world of finance. Managing Director Georgieva reminded us a moment ago that uh, the uh, fight to, towards climate, against climate change gained momentum when it ceased to be a, a sectoral issue for environment ministers and became an issue at the center of the table of councils of ministers. Exactly the same thing applies for health ministers. In, in our commission, there were, as I said, uh, five uh, former uh, heads of states or governments, and I, I had my own experience for a short time. Uh, in normal times, health policy is a very important policy, but peripheral. It comes up and to be the only policy that concentrates the minds of heads of governments when there is a crisis like this. And then they focus on this, and they also make good decisions. But suppose that one year from now, when uh, the G20 meets under Indonesian presidency, there is no longer the pandemic as number one reason for concern of the heads of governments, but uh, some fallout from Afghanistan, uh, or the issue of cybersecurity, or some uh, catastrophe of other sorts, be sure that unless there is a small but permanent structure which crystallizes this momentum of attention now and forces the heads of governments to keep also this in mind for a long time, then this interest, number one topic, will be ephemeral. And since uh, we are convinced, and we show in the uh, report, but also many other reports show that uh, this fight requires fundamental changes, not only in the health sector, but also outside of it. Uh, and, uh, and these fundamental changes are long-term investments and long-term changes in mentality. That's why we, see, we, we say, why doesn't the G20? Of course, uh, Professor Binakvao, a G20 plus, the G20 is uh, originally uh, composed of mainly uh, rich countries, but it has already been uh, able on some occasions to open up to other parts of the world, which will be particularly essential in this case. So uh, an, an enlarged G20 could provide uh, the table for a permanent uh, intimacy between finance ministers and health ministers under the supervision of heads of governments, and therefore 
ensure that there is also a greater predisposition of governments uh, to finance WHO and its uh, needs. And let me uh, just add one uh, remark here, Madam Chair. How did this uh, small idea, but I hope it will fly, come to my mind a few months ago and was adopted in our report? Well, in 2009, the world lost another global public good. Public health is a global public good which was lost now. That time, it was less dramatic to ordinary people, but equally catastrophic to the global economy. The global good, public good that was lost was financial stability. You remember the big crisis. What did the G20 under British presidency do in 2009? They decided to set up a financial stability board. By the way, the first chair of that board was the man who now chairs the overall G20 exercise, Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi, so there is also this elegant historical recurrence. And they uh, worked to give new guidelines to the legislative authorities of all the world, and so far we have not had a second financial crisis of that sort. So let's try to read into history and without, and of course the Secretariat should be with the WHO, the, uh, the WHO Director General should be a prominent member of this board, so not much duplication, but uh, a big leverage and multiplier. In some ways, let me put it like this, it's uh, a chance that uh, this incredible nightmare that we've been through can uh, give us a new tool that makes us a little stronger for the future. Uh, uh, and, and, I, uh, and I believe it was not a bad idea for WHO Europe uh, which set up this commission, because uh, unless you call on people who live out of the box, you cannot have ideas which, which may be good or bad, history will tell, but ideas which are a bit out of the box themselves, like this one. This is very important. It's a time in which thinking out of the box is needed, is one of the key factors. And this is why we will move forward and uh, speak about climate change, because uh, what we just heard about One Health is uh, deeply and strongly connected with this idea of climate change. Join me in a round of applause to our speakers. Uh, thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, thank you, Professor from Rwanda. Thank you, President Monti. And thank you, Professor Mantovani. So, we now move towards, uh, uh, again, global change, climate change, and ecological transition. Thank you very much.